We are privileged to have as our first guest on Focus, Senator John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts. Senator Kennedy, it's a privilege to have you for a number of reasons. Not only because you are a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but because you wrote a book not too long ago entitled Profiles of Courage, which deals with the representative system and the courage of various senators and the idea of being well informed on matters of foreign policy, something which I discussed a little earlier. Uh, furthermore, you wrote a book uh, some time ago entitled Why England Slept, I believe, which deals with the problems of the 1930s, which were also brought up earlier in the program. And therefore, it's a great privilege to have you with us. Thank you very much, Mr. Well, you heard uh, my earlier remarks about the importance of being well informed on foreign policy and the impact of foreign policy on every citizen. Do you see this all the time in your work here in the Senate? Oh, I do. I think that's a life and death issue today, particularly as the advance of science has made it possible for uh, some countries to destroy not only uh, their enemies, but themselves, and in fact, in fact, the whole world. So I would say that this is now a matter of uh, life and death with us, literally. Well, now, when we looked at the background of American foreign policies, and we saw that for a long time during our history, we were isolated from the rest of the world. We took, as a matter of fact, as only as far back as the 1930s, officially a neutral policy in world affairs. And here it is now, we see other new nations uh, that are neutral and perhaps want to be isolated. Do you think there is any relationship between uh, the experience of our past and the phase through which some nations are going today in their nationalistic, uh, in their revolutionary ferment and so forth? Well, I think that uh, any country which has emerged, particularly from a colonial uh, period, which uh, the countries of Africa or Asia are emerging from, and the United States emerged from uh, at the beginning of its uh, history, uh, there's naturally a desire to uh, not become involved in any relationships which might be considered in any sense colonial. And therefore, they moved to what they would hope would be a policy of neutrality. We were able to conduct that policy for uh, certainly more than a hundred years until uh, science uh, and uh, particular political uh, upheavals caused by Hitler in the, the time of the World War II and Japan made it essential for our security that we recognize that whoever controls Europe uh, could affect our security and the same is true in Asia. These other countries uh, are passing through this period much quicker. India might have looked forward to a long period of neutrality so mm -hmm. that she could develop her own internal strength. But the Chinese recently, uh, I think, made her aware that there is no neutrals yes. today in this yes. world. Well, a lot of nations, of course, say to the United States, you were actually, the, as I said earlier, the uh, first colonial power which fought for and won and declared uh, your independence. And a lot of nations, uh, don't you think, uh, look to the United States today as an example of what uh, perhaps well, they Well, that's a great uh, asset like uh, in our uh, relations. We've never been a colonial power except in a limited period, and we did free the Philippines. We have brought Hawaii into the Union as a state. And uh, I think that we have a great uh, asset, which has been dissipated to some degrees in the last 10 years. But in Africa, at the Bendung Conference in, uh, at the, in Indonesia, there was great references to the Declaration of Independence. Yes. The Declaration of Independence is constantly referred to today in Africa. Uh, in Central Africa, they make references to their desire to hold a Boston Tea Party, yes. driving the British out, so that we have a great uh, folklore, uh, which uh, I hope is based in fact, which identifies us with these aspirations. And I've therefore felt that it's important to us in our foreign policy that we attempt to take advantage of this and not turn our back on this nationalist movement. I think that that's a, the most significant factor of post-war foreign policy. It is the, in the fact that it's going to destroy the Soviet empire, in my opinion. We should associate ourselves with it and not challenge it. Well, I'm delighted you brought that out because one of the things we want to get across in this series is the importance of American foreign policies in the past and their relationship to what we are doing today and also parallels that we can draw with other nations. Well, now, you saw a good deal of Europe in the 1930s. Uh, your father was ambassador to the court of St. James. And you, along with a number of other people, saw the rise of aggression, the rise of Hitler and Mussolini. And one of the great problems of the time was knowing exactly what to do when in order to prevent a, a larger conflagration. I wonder if, if you see in the uh, 1930s uh, and the policies of England and the United States toward Hitler and Mussolini anything that might be useful, say, to the times in which we are now. Oh, I think uh, certainly, uh, as it says on the... Uh front of a great uh, Washington building, what is past is prologue. And uh, there's no doubt that the future, uh, that the past hangs over us. I would say we could go back much further than the 30s and go back to the struggle between Athens and Sparta, <laughs> between the totalitarian state and the free society and the difficulty that a free society 
which permits us all to indulge ourselves in a sense has the disadvantages which we have in competition with a system which is able to mobilize the resources to advance the interests of the state i believe in the long run that we are sick going to be successful but it requires a good deal of self discipline if we're going to be able to compete well other words the understanding of american foreign policy uh, you would uh, not only go back to the period we discussed this uh, today but also to that epic struggle between Greece and Sparta, or between Sparta and Athens, between a totalitarian and a well, democratic Well, you remember state. that Sparta ultimately and won. Yes, it did. That's and the reason, uh, though, it was, was first the indulgence, self-indulgence of the Athenians. The second was the very serious mistakes they made in foreign policy, the war against Syracuse. They dissipated their energies. They were unwilling to make the sacrifice when the time came. Sparta may mobilize the resources of the state against the Athenians. Success is not guaranteed to you, no. really, because you happen to be a Democrat <coughs> uh, uh, and believe in the uh, democratic theory. Success comes to those who are able to, uh, through in nature and the whole Darwinian theory, success comes to the survival of the fittest. And we will be fit and we will survive only if we recognize that this requires a very good deal of uh, self-restraint, uh, perseverance, uh, endurance, a willingness to put the long-range national interest ahead of our private interest. We can maintain a free society and be successful, but not merely by just hoping for it. Well, I'm delighted you brought that out because one of the problems in ancient Athens was the lack of uh, cohesion within the alliance. And on our next program, we are going to discuss America's policies in Europe and the, specifically the NATO problem. So you can go back into history and use a lot of these examples of the past to see where we are today. Well, our uh, program today brings us up to 1945. And of course, we came into the war in 1941 uh, when we were attacked. And uh, obviously, when we entered the war, we saw that we had to place priority in uh, fighting in Europe. But certainly during the war, a lot took place which made Americans realize that we were in the foreign policy game for keeps because we had to exercise the responsibility that goes with power. Now, of course, you fought extensively in the Pacific and were primarily concerned with the European uh, area here. But what do you think happened during the war that made Americans realize that we have to accept uh, global responsibility? Well, I think the sac uh, first, the pre-war, history of finally being dragged into a war on two fronts without really having very much to say about the events which led up to the war. If you're going to have to fight, and it looks like now, whatever, we are involved in the attacks on freedom all around the globe, it's well to have some voice in the decisions which finally uh, face you with the, uh, these dire decisions. And I think that we decided after World War II that it was vitally important for the United States to have a voice in the post-war world so that uh, Hitler's and others uh, could not uh, challenge, uh, rise to meet us. Now, and in addition, of course, the overwhelming power of the Soviet Union was a factor which was omnipresent. If the United States had not intervened, they would have taken Europe as the Chinese communists took China. Well, do you think the experience of our not joining the League of Nations in 1919 or 1920 had an impact in our uh, seeing how things went wrong because we weren't participating. Yes, but I think it, uh, we're now a member of uh, the United Nations. It isn't really enough to just join an organization. You have to be willing to decide. And the problem that the French and the British had to face in the 30s was, uh, was it worthwhile fighting over Austria? Was it worthwhile fighting over the uh, uh, Sudeten Deutsch in the time of Czechoslovakia? Finally, they decided it was worthwhile fighting for Poland. Yes. But the, these decisions, the ag uh, aggressors never face you with an all-out challenge. It's always layoffs here or a challenge to Berlin here. It is these small, uh, Tibet, it is these small incursions which uh, they hope to get away with because people hesitate to ever fight, and uh, quite rightly, because peace is our objective. They feel they can keep finally whittling us away. So it's a terribly difficult world in which to live in. But I think that we have to recognize that wherever freedom is attacked and the communists are successful in their attack, uh, so much more difficult than is us for us to defend the remainder. I think that uh, the point that I would make after looking at the 30s and trying to study, as I did in Why England Slept, the influence that the public opinion had on yes, foreign policy, yes. I would say that the problem is for the leadership of a country, which is a free society, to set national goals and bring home to the people the hard the facts of existence and then for the people to be willing uh, to meet those goals. It is a partnership, and, uh, but it requires a very uh, uh, far-seeing and determined leadership uh, in order to uh, set those goals. Otherwise, uh, we will find uh, 25 years from now the Soviet power continuing to grow while we more or less stand still. So I think we've got a big job ahead of us in the 60s. Well, in other words, it's not so much just knowing about foreign policy and our obligations. It has to be driven home uh, to the American people and especially to the young people in the United States who are going to assume these responsibilities as time goes by. 
and i'm delighted you you drove that point home because this is why we are having this series not only to inform but also to get the younger people in particular to understand their responsibilities and their relationships to foreign policies of the united states senator kennedy has been a real privilege to have you with us today and i hope you return many times again thank you very much